something is happening in Memphis, something is happening in our world. And you know, if I was standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of taking a kind of general and panoramic view of the whole of human history up to now, and the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt. And I would watch God's children in their magnificent trek from the dark dungeons of Egypt through or rather across the Red Sea through the wilderness on toward the Promised Land. And in spite of its magnificence, I wouldn't stop there. I would move on by Greece and take my mind to Mount Olympus. And I would see Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Euripides, and Aristophanes assemble around the Parthenon. <laughs> and I would watch them around the Parthenon as they discuss the great and eternal issues of reality, but I wouldn't stop there. I would go on even to the great heyday of the Roman Empire. And I would see developments around there through various emperors and leaders, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even come up to the day of the Renaissance and get a quick picture of all that the Renaissance did for the cultural and aesthetic life of man, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even go by the way that the man for whom I'm named had his habitat. And I would watch Martin Luther as he tacks his 95 theses on the door at the Church of Wittenberg, but I wouldn't stop there. I would come on up even to 1863 and watch a vacillating president by the name of Abraham Lincoln finally come to the conclusion that he had to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even come up to the early 30s and see a man grappling with the problems of the bankruptcy of his nation and come with an eloquent cry that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I wouldn't stop there. Strangely enough, I would turn to the Almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy. Yeah. Now, that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land, confusion all around. That's a strange statement. But I know somehow that only when it is dark enough can you see the star. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way 
that men in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up, and wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same, we want to be free. Good evening and welcome to New York Symposium with Diane Sayre. I'm Dennis Speed. You've just heard the beginning portion of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's April 3rd, 1968 from the mountaintop speech. Uh, this is a speech given uh, approximately 24 hours before King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, it's a section of the speech that people don't usually know, isn't usually played, and happens to be eerily appropriate for the discussion that we are going to have tonight and for the state that the country finds itself in tonight. Um, and to discuss this matter, uh, we will uh, begin a kind of dialogue with Diane Sayre, uh, also Daniel Burke, for people who would be tuning in for the first time, Diane Sayre is a United States president, uh, maybe that too, <laughs> a U.S. senatorial candidate against Chuck Schumer, who uh, I think people unfortunately know too well. Uh, Daniel ran for United States Senate in New Jersey in the past uh, uh, electoral uh, race against Cory Booker. Um, and so... Uh, let me just ask Diane uh, to go first and say something to us about reflections she might have. Uh, this isn't just Dr. Martin Luther King weekend. Today is the actual birthday. Um, and over the course of many decades now, um, Diane, I, and some others have worked with me relevant members of the civil rights movement. And in the course of the week or so uh, that has just transpired, uh, thoughts about these people and about what they stood for and about where our nation stands tonight have been with many of us. So, uh, Diane, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Sure. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> well, for everybody who doesn't know, I was in Washington uh, last Wednesday, Janu January 6th, which has been described by Helga Zeppler-Rusch as a Reichstag fire kind of event, uh, a turning point of sorts where you had a, a provocation, a deadly riot in the Capitol building, <clears throat> which caused a great deal of uproar and outrage. And then by apparent design, immediately in the aftermath, the president of the United States has been barred from using Twitter or Facebook and impeached for a second time in the House of Representatives, uh, allegedly because he supposedly organized an insurrection when the truth of the matter was that he was actually still speaking at the ellipse at the moment that the rioters ran into the Capitol. Uh, so many different things happened in that event, I know one person today who was there at the Capitol, I was not, I was over by the ellipse, um, who said that he actually experienced a physical, a change in people who went from peaceful demonstrators to suddenly becoming, some of them, an angry mob. Other people, when they saw people looting, said, I'm not participating in this, we have to be honorable. Other people got confused because the uh, instigated this, smashed down the doors, but then had people welcoming everyone in as if this was what was supposed to happen, that people were all supposed to go into the Capitol. So there was a great deal of confusion. Uh, there were five people who died. There have been two suicides in the aftermath of this. Um, 
and it's very disturbing for the nation. And therefore I think it's extremely appropriate to reflect on Martin Luther King and to reflect on the poetic principles of justice and natural law, because that's what gives us the potential for victory, not the, vic the short-term victory of Donald Trump somehow in some mysterious magical way taking the White House instead of Biden, which is just a fairy tale to further confuse people, but a victory against the fascist apparatus that ran the witch hunt against Lyndon LaRouche over 30 years ago, and that has been running the witch hunt against President Trump, and which intends to impose a fascist green dictatorship in the Great Reset coming up at the end of this month in Davos, Switzerland. So I just want to share a few things with you. Um, one, very interestingly, and in the spirit of Shakespeare and Schiller and natural law, uh, a commentator for CNN, Douglas Brinkley, was commenting on the impeachment of Trump uh, yesterday and, or I guess Wednesday night, and he said, in effect, that Trump will go down in infamy like um, Benedict Arnold, and I forget who else, and then he named Lyndon LaRouche, who must clearly be on the conscience of these people. Now, we have seen throughout history anyone who names LaRouche in that way, whether it was William Weld when he was running for office in Massachusetts, Oliver North, David Dinkins, anyone who ended up attacking LaRouche by name ended up in a very bad fate. Uh, they did not uh, succeed in winning their election or whatever it was. And LaRouche should be on their mind for other reasons. One of the things that President Trump did yesterday is actually released all of the FBI files in Russiagate. And uh, the Christopher Steele dossier, it turns out, what John, according to John Solomon, who I think hadn't read these documents yet, they stack about a foot and a half tall, but he was speculating that part of what would be in there was an interview with Christopher Steele, where he admits that the whole dossier was written simply to divert attention from the fact that Hillary Clinton's emails revealed that she had stolen the election from Bernie Sanders, that she had stolen the, the Democratic nomination, which of course we don't hear about because we were so busy hearing about Russia. The other thing in the Steele dossier, don't forget, is that uh, they name Lyndon LaRouche as having ties to Russia and having sent people over to Russia, perhaps to even help establish uh, contact for Trump. So LaRouche is really on their mind. And uh, I think that one of the most powerful things that the president could do at this point is to issue a presidential pardon of Julian Assange, Ed Snowden, and emphatically Lyndon LaRouche, who really should be exonerated. Uh, but I don't know that the president can do that. Um, this would shatter this apparatus. Um, so this is very interesting. We're about to see a reassertion of natural law. Now, otherwise, similarly, the, the heavy-handed Nazi Gestapo-like response, Goebbels-like response of banning the president of the United States from using the social media to reach his people has not been missed on the world. Uh, Lopez Obrador of Mexico uh, talked about the Holy Inquisition. And I wanna share with you what was said by the spokeswoman of the Russian foreign ministry, Maria Zakharova, who called it the equivalent of a nuclear explosion. She said, recently all major social media platforms in the United States have blocked the account of the president of the United States. These social media have closed an official account with millions of followers without a court ruling or the opinion of professional ethics agencies. Even those American allies who are not so closely related to Trump himself cannot tolerate the blow to Western values by this behavior. 
The after effects are worse than destruction. A blow has been dealt to the democratic values professed by Western society. Both darknet apologists and the advocates of harsh censorship have instantly gained a substantial argument. The media market has begun to be reshaped and a massive digital migration is afoot. Uh, so that's from the spokeswoman for the Russian foreign ministry. And um, I just have one last thing I wanna share with you from Martin Luther King also, and I wanna welcome Christopher Wright who has now joined us uh, as well. And Daniel is waving at you, Christopher, if you can see. <laughs> Thank you, hey, good to see you, right? <laughs> yeah, good, <laughs> glad you made it. So I was looking at a book by Martin Luther King, um, maybe you can see it, Why We Can't Wait. Uh, and I think this is very significant. I haven't finished rereading it, but I'm gonna share with you a couple of things to think about how do you defeat a force? This is what Lyndon LaRouche spoke about all the time. How do you defeat a force which seems by physical terms to be superior? That is, they can outgun you, they can outmedia you, they can outfinance you. Uh, how do you actually defeat them? King describes the situation of two uh, children, Negro children, as he describes them, in 1963, one sitting on a stoop of a vermin-infested apartment house in Harlem with garbage in the halls and the drunks and the jobless are figures of his everyday world. Uh, his mother is asleep and domestic working for a family on Long Island. His father is a uh, doorman who cannot be advanced because of the color of his skin. He says, I see a young Negro girl sitting on the stoop of a rickety one, wooden one family house in uh, and some visitors would call it a shack. It needs paint and the patched up roof appears in danger of caving in. Half a dozen small children in various stages of undress are scampering about the house. The girl is forced to play the role of their mother. She can no longer attend the all Negro school in her neighborhood because her mother died only recently in a car accident. Neighbors say if the ambulance hadn't come so late to take her to the all Negro hospital, the mother might still be alive. So what is the power of these children? What is the power of the black population in this situation where literally it seems the entire system is arrayed against them. And I wanna share with you what uh, Martin Luther King says in this book. He says, it is an axiom of social change that no revolution can take place without a methodology suited to the circumstances of the period. During the 50s, many voices offered substitutes for the tactic of legal resource. Recourse. Some called for a colossal bloodbath to cleanse the nation's ills. To support their advocacy of violence and an incitement, they pointed to an historical tradition reaching back from the American Civil War to Spartacus in Rome. But the Negro in the South in 1955, assessing the power of the forces arrayed against him, could not perceive the slightest prospect of victory in this approach. He was unarmed, unorganized, untrained, disunited, and most important, psychologically and morally unprepared for the deliberate spilling of blood. Uh, then going on, I'm skipping. The doctrine they preached was nonviolent doctrine. It was not a doctrine that made their followers yearn for revenge, but one that called upon them to champion change. It was not a doctrine that asked an eye for an eye, but one that summoned men to seek to open the eyes of blind prejudice. The Negro turned his back on force, not only because he knew he could not win his freedom through physical force, but also because he believed that through physical force, he could lose his soul. Fortunately, History does not pose problems without eventually producing solutions. 
the disenchanted, the disadvantaged, and the disinherited seem at times of deep crisis to summon up some sort of genius that enables them to perceive and capture the appropriate weapons to carve out their destiny. Such was the peaceable weapon of nonviolent direct action, which materialized almost overnight to inspire the Negro and was seized in his outstretched hands with a powerful grip. Acceptance of nonviolent direct action was proof of a certain sophistication on the part of the Negro masses, for it showed that they had dared to break with the old ingrained concepts of our society. The eye for an eye philosophy, the impulse to defend oneself when attacked had always been held as the highest measure of American manhood. We are a nation that worships the frontier tradition and our heroes are those who champion justice through violent retaliation against injustice. It is not simple to adopt the credo that moral force has as much strength and virtue as the capacity to return a physical blow or that to refrain from hitting back requires more will and bravery than the automatic reflexes of defense. So I will stop there and I guess um, turn it over to Daniel and then we'll hear from Christopher. Okay, Daniel. Thank you very much, uh, Diane, for reading that. That was really uh, very much appreciated. Um, I think it's absolutely, I mean, it becomes a big issue is how do we measure ourselves? How is it that we measure the progress that we know we have to make against what is an intended global fascism? Because if we try to measure ourselves on the basis of uh, how much injustice is inflicted upon us and the people across the world uh, with whom we identify, then uh, we will get quickly discouraged but in fact, you know, you're reminding me from that section of from King of the Gorgias dialogue in which Plato uh, recounts the discussion of Socrates on what is worse, to suffer injustice or to, uh, to cause injustice to another. Um, he comes down on the side that to cause injustice to another uh, which damages your own immortal soul is in fact the worse, uh, despite the fact that everyone conventionally believes that the most important thing is to avoid having injustice done to you. Um, I'm also reminded of a beautiful statement from Lyndon LaRouche that he dictated from prison, uh, I believe in 1991, uh, 1990, excuse me, which is titled In the Garden of Gethsemane. And I think it gets to why it is that we're gonna win <laughs> if we take this approach. He says, in brief, I'm just gonna read about two short paragraphs. If we were to project events on the basis of what is taught in the schools about revolutions and other struggles of the past, then the human race at present were doomed. If we say, that people struggle against this and that oppression and so forth and out of rage or whatnot, overthrow their cruel oppressor, we should lose. The human race would lose. However, if we touch the force of love, the spark of divine reason, we unleash a force, a creative force, a divine force, which is greater than any adversary and we win. Those revolutions, which are based upon the appeal to this divine spark of reason within the individual prevailed. Those which worked otherwise produced abominations or simply failed. Yes, we must struggle against injustice, but it is not enough to struggle out of anger. We must struggle out of love. And that we learn best who have had to walk as leaders of one degree or another through our own Gethsemane with the image of the cross before us. 
and I think that that's absolutely the challenge. Each of us has to become a leader of the sublime sort. That's what we must strive for uh, without any, you know, without any, you're not gonna measure your achievement as a leader by whether or not people call you one or people give you respect or whether, you know, you get all types of attention, certainly not by how many, how many views are on your YouTube video. Um, you know, I mean, not that uh, all of those things, well, by all means, you know, get, get it out there. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I value very much that Chris has a, uh, has a YouTube channel where he discusses these, you know, the truth is to the best of his ability as we each desire to. But obviously the point is that that's not the, that's not actually the issue. The issue is, uh, is the quality of insight uh, and, um, and that being that which can, you know, lift us up to the level we need to be at to defeat this, uh, this crisis, to overcome the crisis that we're in. I'll put it that way. So I'm, I'm very eager to continue that kind of work with this, um, with this image of King and to pursue the, this, you know, to advance the actual steps that are needed such that um, association of people across the world can overcome this global fascism with a program for economic development and physical advancement of the species. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So we're gonna to go to Christopher who is calls himself New York's favorite conservative. That may be true. Uh, he's got a show, I guess, called the Christopher Wright Show, which just got started. And I think one of his first guests was Diane but uh, Christopher, I met actually up in New York, I think in Harlem at, during the walkaway movement, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and just uh, happy that you're with us and take it away. You may be muted. Are you still muted, Christopher? Yeah. Got on mute. Gonna write, gotta run a talk show. You gotta know these things. Sorry about that. That's all right. Go right ahead. All right. I'm sorry. I was, I, I'm sorry. I'm looking kind of. You know, I'm trying to multitask right here. I'm not doing a good job. But um, were you? What's the question you were asking me again? I just said hello and brought you up on the screen. And oh, okay. just uh, yeah. And, and uh, Daniel had just finished his remarks. So now there you are. Bam. Yeah, the one and only. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Good. <laughs> so what we've been doing, so you know, is that we've had, we, we just started the show. We had a clip from the uh, speech that King gave, the April 3rd, 68 speech. And, and the important thing is we didn't play the usual one about I've been to the mountaintop. We did the one about if I were standing at the beginning of space and time and the almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, in what age would you like to live? And he starts out and he talks about being in Egypt or being in Rome, Greece, uh, Florence, uh, you know, Wittenberg, where Mount Martin Luther, after whom he's named, you know, put his 95 theses up, et cetera. Clinton, Roosevelt, he says, if I went through all those places, I wouldn't stop any place. I'd say, strangely enough, if you would allow me to live a few years in the 20th century, I would be happy. And that's a strange statement to make because the world's all messed up, confusion's all around, trouble's in the land, but, I know that when it seems to be the darkest, that's when you get to see the stars. And then he says something is happening in America and around the world. It's a strange force and people are rising up. Uh, and, and it's not a, so that's the concept that he's laying out. And this is the sanitation workers, let's remember. All right, most of whom had not graduated the eighth grade. Many of whom, of course, there's other people in the audience, about 600 people that night. It's a very stormy night. Church holds well over 1,200, almost 2,000 people. Uh, it's, a, it's a case where it's very uncertain what's going to happen with this demonstration. A lot of things have happened. Uh, and, and King is very uncertain. But that's the setting in which he then goes on to give the words to talk about the things he talks about. So we uh, thought this was a useful place to start. Diane then talked about the Capitol being down there January 6th, some of the things she saw, some of the things she thought the ways in which people are being both uh, identified and vilified, but also the problem that the uh, new process that's underway is vindictive, is revengeful, and actually is worsening the situation. 
And so we sort of set a certain context and you heard some of what Daniel said. And Daniel, I guess, is going to have to be get, get going in about 15 minutes. So wanted to hear from you. Then we'll go back and see if Daniel's got something further or Diane's got something further. Okay, good, good. Well, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. Got it. Can't, got it. Can't hear you. Speak in. No, no, you, you're, you're just low. Volume's low. How about any better now? Any yeah, better? Yeah, be better? Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, well, I think if I had to go anywhere into where I, I would say the whole, and which when it comes to that message, is Dr. King, what he really pushed more than anything was being peaceful when it came to getting your message across when you got to get it across and make it and do it in a peaceful way, in a nonviolent way. And what I realized that really kind of came to fruition, and I saw it before even the event on the 6th in DC. And at a lot of our events, as you know, MAGA side of things, we keep it peaceful. Um, I've been in all our events. You know, we're not looking for trouble. We're not trying to fight anybody. We're not looking for a fight. If anything is ever any conflict, it's because it's brought to us and people are in self-defense a lot of times. But I'm, what I'm seeing is, is, is another level I'm seeing to what the kind of an enemy's way of doing things. Because it seemed like back in Martin Luther King's days, they were just coming after King and his followers, saying we're anti, you know, uh, civil rights or blacks or something like that and they will get physical right there on the spot where now as you can see as they do undercover where they'll dress up like MAGA and act like they're on our side and they'll cause trouble um, that way and cause trouble in our name with our out you know whatever the clothing or whatever on to make it look like it's us so we're beyond we're take we got to take King's fight to the next level and of course I'm not trying to discredit anything that Martin Luther King did he, Martin Luther King Jr. was a great man great leader taught me so a lot about being a great man and a great leader myself. But we need to take his movement and keep it peaceful, just like he did still. But we got to get in a way that's, we got to kind of check every every corner on turn, left, you know, no rock unturned, because now they're trying to go beyond our peace by, you know, infiltrating um, in like an underground manner to destroy the movement. So we got to keep it peaceful, like King always said, but we just got to be you know, kind of turn, leave no current corner unturned, because with any situation, obviously, they couldn't be white people um, acting like they were black to be undercover. <laughs> like, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, they, that they weren't black people in the black community that would give him issues at the time as well. But uh, I just see in this in this particular situation that we're dealing with the similarities, but the the differences um, are the differences that kind of separate due to the time frame and the different. You know, ours is more political based, so. Yeah, that's, I think, what I want to kind of bring to the table. Well, I guess I should say something about that, because actually the King's situation is exactly the situation. That's precisely what happened, because what had occurred was in the summer of 1966, after Stokely Carmichael, who was part of King's movement initially, declared or began to talk about black power, what had happened is during 1967, King found himself in conflict, particularly with the young people who were in the various cities, particularly in Chicago, for example, around the yeah. issue of violence it was precisely around that issue because what was said was that King's movement was old hat, was passe, uh, and that the uh, question was a new militancy that had to come about. And that's, for example, what was caused to be the background motivation behind what happened in the Detroit riot of 67 July and what happened in the Newark riot also of that year in which many people died, about 30 people died in Newark uh, quite a few people died also in Detroit. King was then finding himself in constant conflicts with these people. And in Memphis, what had happened specifically was he had led a demonstration, uh, which he had led during, uh, during March, uh, which had suddenly become violent in the back of the demonstration. And there was a group of people who were referred to as the invaders. That was a street gang, which was said to be the origin of it, Nobody's exactly sure exactly how it started. What happened was some windows were broken out. Some people were, uh, you know, some things, some shots got fired. A couple of people got killed. And so King's circumstance was exactly this circumstance. Uh, and, and, and that's what, uh, and, and in part one can argue, though I think it's interesting to look at that, that the assassination itself occurred within that context. So, um, Actually, the circumstance that you are just describing was precisely the one he was in. Uh, it's one of those things. It's not a well-known history, 
because people have mythologized the King history. Uh, and the King history was extremely political. In fact, that's why there is a direct relationship, in fact, between what happened in the Capitol and what happened to him. Just thought uh, I would throw that in. So you did. No, no, no. You, I, I definitely need a little history lesson there. That was uh, good to know because he said, I, I, you know, the school history of Martin Luther King, like the back of my hand, like a lot, I'm sure a lot of you guys do, but uh, there is a lot of part of Martin Luther King's history I didn't learn until I got older and learned, went back on my own and looked at what he had to deal with. And uh, it, was, it was very interesting, especially later on in life, uh, the fights he was part, uh, going up against that was not just civil rights, but he had other issues that he was up against, going up against. And I feel that like King was really trying to really broaden his, um, uh, the fight he was putting out, out there that was going on in the country. So yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Sure. Yeah, Daniel, I know you have to get going. So you have anything that you want to? Oh, well, I, I really do think that that's not, I mean, I think you're right. Uh, the, this question of his address of the uh, of the Vietnam War um, mm -hmm. a year before he died at Riverside Church. Uh, it's exactly what you're describing, Chris. And you know, it, I mean, it gets into what we're dealing with right now. Uh, the King understood at that point that the true that the enemy that he had to confront was, you know, the kind of um, failure. Uh, uh, to to prevent the military industrial complex that Eisenhower had warned about from dragging us into a totally insane imperialist war that was completely destructive for the United States population and everyone. And of course, King, I mean, King would have, would have at least understood that, that, that John Kennedy was trying to prevent us from doing that. So he had to stand up against something much bigger um, than many people wanted to deal with. Uh, I'm not, I meant than many people wanted to deal with. And I think that that's what people have to acknowledge. A lot of people, there's all types of confusion about what happened January 6th. You know, some people are bragging about it and saying, oh, this is a great thing we did, you know, and, uh, and Trump really screwed us by not supporting it. Or I don't know, like, you know, Nick Fuentes and these kind of really strange people saying all kinds of weird things. But it should be obvious that there is some, uh, control over this thing, which means that uh, Trump was uh, attacked by the intelligence state, the, intel the surveillance state, you know, it's called uh, the fraud of Russiagate. The average Trump supporter was attacked by these instigators you're talking about, right. Uh, and so you get to the, the and in the meanwhile, uh, this same sort of military industrial complex embodied in Mike Pompeo, who was a total traitor to Trump, uh, oh. is putting us into threat of war. And so, oh. you know, I saw a really good uh, sort of mocking of Pompeo right now on Twitter from some people who were, you know, just saying, hey, you know, he, Pompeo's up there bragging. He thinks he did a great job. And he's talking about how we're gonna go into new provocations in the South China Sea against China militarily. And someone who's a conservative, you know, voice said, gee, it's, you know, <laughs> yes, 70 million Americans were labeled as domestic terrorists, but it was worth it for the South China Sea. You know, this kind of way that the, that the Trump movement was, you know, that the, the goals of people who uh, were pursuing the support of the president have been usurped. They've been totally usurped. So uh, my point is, if you look at these various layers, we're up against something bigger you know, I mean, the, big, the, the question is not Antifa, Antifa that most people are concerned about. Who is it that controls the strings of both Antifa and QAnon? And if you're going to begin to think on that level, then you have to think about solutions that deal with a systemic problem in the world, uh, which is this Anglo-Dutch system of world financial oligarchy. Uh, and I think that that's the kind of thing that if we can make that explicit for people, um, then we get a chance to, to, to draw them into the solution concept, um, which is what, anyway, that's what I know Diane's campaign is all about. Diane? Yeah, and one challenge we have today is actually that the news media is so much worse. It was bad in the 60s, I'm not saying the press was honest at that time, but there were certain things that occurred which profoundly moved 
people around the country, like this six-year-old girl getting handcuffed by the police in, was it Birmingham? Yeah. yeah, Birmingham, Alabama. And King describes it in this book. He said, it was very powerfully moving to the soul of people who were standing on the sidelines to see children. He said, at a certain point, children would run after the police officers asking to be arrested, knowing they had done no wrong and knowing that the jails were full and the police didn't have anywhere to put them. And it was like a drama which ended up involving the entire nation, knowing that you had six-year-old children who were being fire hosed and having dogs sent after them and sent into prisons and so on. The, the young women in Montgomery described the day all the children came out and ended up getting taken off to prison, put on a cold prison floor where they were given coffee with salt in it and bread with rocks in it. Um, but this was known by the country. Today, we do have an additional challenge because people have been, um, we have a lot of garbage over people's identities, even though I think underneath you can still reach the conscience of people, which is why criminals will never prevail ultimately. Uh, but think about our culture where they say we have hate crimes, right? If you call someone the wrong gender, if you use the wrong pronoun, you can be banned from whatever, accused of all kinds of things. And in fact, that's considered a crime. But if someone punched you in the face after you did that, the punching you in the face would be considered completely legitimate. I mean, that's what's so weird. Remember what we heard from uh, the quote unquote resistance against Trump early on. They said, he is a fascist and we are therefore justified in using violence, right? So you cannot use the wrong words. People have to have safe spaces to protect themselves from language that they don't like, but it's legitimate to beat the crap out of somebody because you just, because they're on the wrong side. So there's a great deal of confusion in the American population, but I think underneath that people do have a sense of the difference between right and wrong. People have an ability to respond to things that are beautiful, for example, they also uh, can recognize when things that are ugly. And one thing that I have to say coming up, which is spectacularly ugly, is what Biden has planned for his inauguration ceremony, where he's gonna have Lady Gaga. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's terrible. And I forget what else, it's gonna be some awful parade. And I have a video that I've shared of weird Al Yankovic doing his imitation of Lady Gaga, where. He runs around dancing with raw meat on and stuff like that. You gotta send that one to me, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> the weird house man. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway. I mean, that's gonna be the Biden inauguration. It's gonna be a total freak show, okay? So if that doesn't tell people what's going on in the country. You know, Chris, uh, I wanted to- I agree, I agree. And it just seems like to me the what's going on with the left is is you know the, the you know they're taking God out of everything this country, but the left are the ones who are really pushing that narrative more than anybody, even when it comes to polit in the pol political spectrum, and it shows. I mean, you know, you got him. He did an interview when he wanted to talk to the black community during his uh, during the, during the, the election. He reached out to Cardi B to do an interview. It's like, you know, for if you want to reach out to a community of people, you you know that the representative you feel for that community is Cardi B. And so it's like, and now you're saying Lady Gaga's be coming out doing his inauguration. Is she going to sing the national anthem? Like, and it's just to me, I look at the Democratic Party and their, and their policies and what they're doing and their actions, and it's just dark to me. Just in terms of light to dark, it's just way getting darker and darker and darker and darker as time goes by. And to me, I just don't see any, you know, when it comes to anything on the left, when it comes to their rallies or you know their protests. It's everybody's wearing black. It's all black masks, black everything. People got negative attitudes. They're cussing. They're threatening people. They're burning down buildings. They're killing. They're rioting. They're looting. 
And now we're seeing with the Biden, you know, presidency, it's just always negativity, always negativity. Oh, Trump is bad. Trump is bad. This country is bad. This country's racist. This country's this. We're under a bunch of Nazis here. All oh, have the country is, uh, you know, all this stuff they're saying. It's always negative, always darkness. And that's what, to me, scares me the most about not just the Biden Harris presidency, but just the future of the and when it comes to the left left wing politics. It's like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, it seems like. And I don't know how we're supposed to come and meet something in the middle that has that kind of attitude. And I don't know. It's And, and you see how their behavior, like I talked about the behavior between the MAGA movement and what they're doing. And, you know, we pretty much said we do the best to keep it peaceful. And to them, they look like they're growing out to look for trouble. And I don't know how you're supposed to sit down and have a conversation with that kind of way of thinking, those kind of people. Well, actually, I think something has happened since the ban, the Twitter ban. And uh, we mentioned some of the world leaders that responded, but also there have been other people, including people like Glenn Greenwald, who would normally be considered to be on the left, except that the people on the left have tried to dis you know, disown him. That's what happened at the Intercept, where he, which he founded, but he found himself ostracized because he dared to write an article which was critical of Joe Biden, and he wanted it printed before the election. And it was around that dispute uh, in which they said to him, the magazine he founded told him he could not run that article. And so it was on the basis of that that he left. Um, and then you, of course, have other cases. Jimmy Dore is another case. Jimmy Dore, of course, is uh, and res describes himself as a pot smoking comedian okay, who thinks of himself as being, of course, in the Bernie Sanders kind of wing of things. But all he tried to do was to force a vote on the floor of Congress prior to the election of Nancy Pelosi. And this was supposed to be uh, withholding your vote until there is an agreement that we will have a debate on the House floor about Medicare for all, or rather this idea of single payer health insurance, different ways people talk about it. Now that seems to be, and had been a cause that uh, AOC said she was for. Pelosi had said she was for that in 1994, there should be a debate. And what happened was that the squad and Ocasio-Cortez also refused to do what 100,000 people had assembled in a town hall meeting. Now, these are all people who clearly would have described themselves as left liberal or even left radical. And they couldn't get that to happen. They couldn't get any receptivity from AOC or Ilan Omar or any of these people, all of whom voted for Pelosi. So there's an interesting situation in the country right now. I think that uh, the labels that people have used, including the ones they've used to describe themselves, are, are proving to be bankrupt. They don't describe people because they're now seeing that the people that they think represent them are frauds. And the idea of suppressing the presidents with Twitter, right, that means everybody gets suppressed because you, the thought, you are not even able to think certain things. You can't think the thought the election was fraudulent or there was fraud in the election, you can't even question whether that happened because that's said to be out of bounds. And that's been revealed to the whole world. Now, how does the, how does the United States go to the world now and talk about free elections, freedom of thought, freedom of speech? It, it, it's, 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 it's something that is observed by people all over the place. They're all seeing that. And so I think it's a, it's a bit different situation it's much more open in one sense, but it doesn't have that Republican Democratic strict uh, strict uh, definition. Uh, that's, that's a very good point. I agree. Um, like since America's founding, uh, there we've been the pushers of uh, free election, freedom of speech, you know, freedom to you know, you know, have uh, you know guns and everything like that. So it just, I don't know, is that to me, it's like, I, I, it's just so hard for me to even imagine America at, based on a fraudulent election. I mean, people sometimes when you they, when they talk about America fraudulent elections, they go to 2000 with Bush and, and Gore and try to use that as an example where one side, you know, manipulate another side. And, you know, there's no hard court, no hard evidence proven, you know, either way that's the case. Mm -hmm. 
But the fact that we have something that's so in the American people's face at this, like, it's like, what else do you need to see for yourself to know that this is something wrong here? Even if you don't believe mm-hmm. this is a stolen election, you know, Trump's right. the winner. Da, da, da. If, but if you had enough logical common sense in this, you know, logical thinking, you can look and see there's something wrong with the situation here. So if we're going to go ahead and just go January 20th, Biden's the president of the United States. This is just the way America is. To me, this is like the moment where America becomes the official hypocritical state. Like there's been situations where people have kind of said, oh, America's a hypocrite maybe a little bit on this subject or that subject. Mm-hmm. But now you can just say, no, if pants a butt, anybody around the world can say, America, you're full of nonsense mm-hmm. from this point on. So mm-hmm. this is the risk we're taking by doing what we're doing when it comes to this election. The other aspect is actually, if people go along with this, we're gonna have nuclear war. I mean, that is what the Biden administration is. You look at the people that he's appointed, you look at what he was part of with Obama, okay? Benghazi, the Libya situation, a Nazi coup in Ukraine, the- Drones. What, Dennis? Drones. Drone assassinations. Oh, the drones. Yeah, so we will, and we're kind of at a threshold here, you know, Putin, I must say, this Russian, I don't know what you want to call it, stoicism is rather amazing, because I can't imagine there are not hardliners in Russia who think Putin ought to wipe us off the face of the earth, given that we're surrounding them with nuclear weapons, Uh, You remember what Obama did right before he left office? We expelled all these Russian diplomats and shut down their consulates. And Obama said, well, uh, someone had asked the reason. He said, it doesn't matter. If we do these things to them, people will presume they're guilty. I mean, just the the real in your face are these things where we're flying within a few feet of their fighter jets (laughs) when you're going, you know, 800 miles an hour, wherever fast they're going, and someone comes like that close to you, as Helga LaRouche has said, when the fate, when avoiding World War III depends on the skill of a single fighter pilot, you're, I mean, that's what we have with Biden. So you're right. The point is we can't tolerate, we can't allow him to get his agenda through, and we have to actually develop a resistance, which is potent, which is effective, which stops the policy. And that's sort of the great challenge of our time is how do you do that? And that's why I think the King example is so relevant and what he said and the why we we can't wait, where he said that at every moment like this, uh, people who are oppressed or whatever, that, that God would never create a situation where you could not, by a stroke of genius, figure out how to address it. And in a sense, that's what's confronting us, is this genius. There are some various comments in the uh, chat. I'm going to tell you, Diane, let's see. There's a couple questions also, just so you know. Um, One uh, question is, does anyone believe something might happen during inauguration next week? Uh, then Kynan is saying this, despite King's push for nonviolent direct action and solving the many problems uh, confronting humanity, many people are disillusioned and feel MLK's approach is inadequate. What are your thoughts? Uh, then there's someone, Daniel here, not our Daniel, but another Daniel saying the right and the left are a one. They are controlled from the top down by the same parasites. And then there's a kind of response saying there were many FBI operations run against Martin Luther King that kept him from doing all he wanted got the LaRouche treatment, uh, and then someone who's just reflecting on the fact that they had been visited by the FBI after 9-11. Um, uh, it was two weeks after 9-11. Uh, they said something about the British being behind 9-11, and there were, somebody had obviously told about that. So those are some of the comments, Diane, if, if you have any response to any of them. You don't mind going downstairs and you go back to Well, I think that um, inauguration I don't know. I think they're really enjoying saying that all kinds of terrible things are going to happen there because it's part of being able to vilify President Trump and his supporters. Will something happen there? I don't know. I'm not going to speculate. I don't know. Um, It's a lot of this is 
psychological warfare, but as we saw January 6th, they're perfectly prepared to have people die. Um, <clears throat> and as we saw 9-11, I think this question of the British is crucial. A lot of people are confused and think that we have enemies other than the British empire, like in Venezuela or Iran or China's the big boogeyman of the moment. And uh, actually the reason why China is so targeted is that the US and China both, they're the two largest economies of the world. So if they were able to work together, you could defeat this dictatorship. And that's what the oligarchs don't want, particularly in London. Um, but I think what often is missing and uh, seems to be people are not so much considering it also in the questions is a faith in natural law and or God, you can say that, but that the universe is created. It's called a universe because there are principles which apply throughout and you cannot succeed if you violate them perpetually. So something's going to give and the challenge is if you want to be victorious, then you have to tune your mind and your thinking and your actions to these principles of natural law. And that's how you succeed. And that's the challenge for all of us, why we really have to do a lot of tough work and thinking right now. Well, we're kind of coming up toward the end, it looks like, because of this in time. Uh, I mean, not that we have to sign off exactly, but I just wonder if there's any areas that we want to hit on or talk about. And, um, you know, one of the things that, of course, uh, comes up is the, what do people do now? And, you know, we'll be doing our town meeting tomorrow, Saturday, and uh, taking up some elements. You'll be involved, Diane. Also, Harley Schlanger will be with us that for that. Uh, and uh, Paul Gallagher, uh, who's going to be talking about the actual economic basis of fascism. And uh, Marsha Baker. So that's going to be at 2 o'clock tomorrow. We'll, we'll be taking up this. And it's sort of a continuation of the discussion from last week about how to think in a time of crisis. But I, I wonder if, you, and I, this I think is important just to talk about also with, with Christopher concerning, you know, the earlier days of the walkaway movement, what people saw and what you yourself said about the Democratic Party, because you're a, a, a younger individual, uh, certainly than myself. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested to, to know uh, in terms of, let's say, I'm going to ask about the last 20 years, let's say since 9-11, because you've seen America over that period of time, certainly. But, mm -hmm. but what is it that you think needs to be done? What has to happen that would efficiently involve a lot of people, particularly people uh, in their 30s, 40s, 20s even, in, in that, such that they would trust the process and be, be involved? What do you think? Um, I think the biggest issue, I'm a millennial, um, and I think the issue I'm noticing with my peers is we have the lack of nationalism, the lack of patriotism, like that. When I was a little young, when I was young, I remember living in this country when I was a young boy, and also I'm a military brat, so I'm sure it adds a little more fuel to the fire. But I remember there was a, a strong just love and respect for America. It was like, you know, the red, white, and blue, Star Spangled Banner, stand up, put your hand on your heart, you know, say the pledge at school in the morning, you know. Um, I remember them mentioning God in the, on the speaker system in the morning, did like a morning prayer. Like that's like would be unheard of now to do something like that in a school. But that was to me, that's normal. And like to me, being an American when I was younger, it wasn't a thought process. It was just like almost like in my blood. And what made there's been and when 9-11 happened and when this recent incident happened with the Trump election in 2016, there have been times in America when I got older where it was time for patriots to stand up and, and make their voices heard. And I automatically did it without even hesitation. And with the older I got, and as time got, what got uh, went by, what I'm noticing more and more is more is less of that. People stand up for this country, and more like it's cool to make fun of America, mock America, play victim when it comes to regards to America. Oh, I, this you know, oh, I can't never do anything in America. I'm black, or oh, you know, because I'm a woman, I can't ever be successful here. So everybody's always got something to say why America's holding them back. And I'm like, well. Why don't you go somewhere else if that's if you are an adult and you're a responsible adult and you can you know stand up for yourself, do what you gotta do. If America's holding back that much, go somewhere else. They don't want to do that because they know America's the best place in the world to live right now. So, but the fact that there's a lack of patriotism and lack of nationalism, 
it's affecting us in a way where it people think it's cool to not stand up for America anymore. And those other people are a lot of people my age. And that's really unfortunate. What I, the positive thing I do see occurring though is the generation below mine, Gen Z. Uh, that's the age around five to 21, I believe. Mm -hmm. There, I call them the internet generation. Like I remember when the internet officially came out, my dad was military, so he knew about it 10 years before the public knew about it. So as soon as the internet hit on a public library, in a, you know, as soon as it, in, our, in where we live, he took us there to set up our email address because he wanted to know that it's very, very important. So, but I remember a, a lot of my life before there was the internet, before internet was even around, like, you know, when riding the bikes around the neighborhood, looking for your friend's bikes in the front yard, you know, everybody was sitting there hanging out, and that's where your friends were. So I remember that kind of life. But I know the generation below me, I talk with them all the time. They were born and raised on the internet. They don't know America without an internet. And that can, people hear that and go, oh my gosh, that's a bad thing. But there's two sides, you know, to every story. And the good side of that story is that young generation, they look on the YouTube channels and they look at the people, the content creators like myself and, you know, ABLs of the world and Brandon Tatum's, that we are their main source of news. Like going, going to the television for news to them is like, why would I do that? That's weird. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, you know, so that's why they're trying to heavily sense the internet so much from the conservative voice, because they know that there's a whole generation of youth that we have more control over the news, what they listen to than they do. So that to me is the change I've solved just from childhood to the adulthood in America. And this is why I see where we're at now. And I think in the future, there is a light at the end of the tunnel because of Gen Z is the main reason. The millennials, some of us are just way out there and lost, but there's few of us that can be still red-pilled and saved. A lot of us are red-pilled, but Gen Z to me is gonna be the conservative generation. Hmm. That's interesting. Diane, you have anything to respond to in that? That is interesting. No, I find that it's it hadn't occurred to me to think about the effect, the younger generation as one of the specific reasons why they want to censor all these things. And that's really interesting. Um, it makes sense. Um, no, in terms of what to be done, I mean, there's one thing I'm thinking about, which some people may not see is the most urgent or pressing, but it's my intention that the state of New York is going to have a one man one vote policy by the time we get to 2021, the mayoral race, because I don't think our nation will last if we don't have a system to have fair elections. And I think Americans should not get all tied up. I mean, there's certain things urgently to be done now, but if we don't address that problem, forget it. There's no way of changing things. We know we had the NSA whistleblowers, Bill Binney and Kirk Wiebe, who actually contacted every single state, Secretary of State and the territories, Guam and Puerto Rico and so on, and said, we have devised a hack proof system to have elections where you didn't have a zillion phony ballots and dead people and all of this, and not one single Secretary of State responded to them. So I think the state of New York um, should be the first and uh, Christopher, you're going to work with me on this, I hope. I'm going to count on you to do that. Um, <laughs> good. Derek Gibson, who's running for governor, who couldn't be here because of a medical situation that came up with someone in his family. Um, but anyway, we've got to get this done. I don't think it's acceptable. And I think a lot of people will agree if it's put on the table that way. Yeah, actually, I, that causes me to make sure that I mentioned that on Monday, on the actual Martin Luther King Day, we have a, a, a panel that we're doing, which is a discussion uh, and will feature uh, this idea of citizens committees for truth in elections, because the complaints about American elections have been going back way a good 20 years and more, but specifically the election of 2000, 2004, 2016, 2012, there were always people, that's, that's separate from the, the state elections, uh, but we have been had complaints about the federal level as well as the state level. And so uh, just to say for everybody, this idea that in each state, a group of citizens put themselves forward to uh, ensure that the process, for example, paper ballots, getting rid of the machines, uh, figuring out, for example, certain kinds of pilot projects that could be done where we try to get what we might call absolute voting. In other words, let's say you have a town, a small town, 20,000 people, and there are 15,000 adults, let's just say what it is, 
let's say 2,000 of them for some reason can't vote or are disqualified from voting, maybe there's 3,000, whatever, but whatever is left over, let's just say there's about 10,000 people left who are actually eligible to vote. Can we get a situation where among those people in that town, they decide that whatever their political uh, persuasion is or lack thereof, they're going to combine for a purpose of trying to get the vote to something above 90%. 90% of people go out and vote, if not 100%, 100% is hard, but over 90%, which then what would that do? It doesn't matter who you're voting for, by the way. You can decide to write people's names in if you don't like the candidates, but you are now electing to participate. So you've now changed the idea of election from I want this candidate to I am electing to participate. I'm now carrying out my duty as a citizen. I'm not just talking about my rights, in other words, okay? And and how I'm, I'm oppressed and I want my rights. How about I'm not oppressed and then <laughs> I'm carrying out this duty, okay? I start with that and we all get together and then that's the bind, that's the combination, that's the glue, that's the, 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 pat, the process in which we're all involved and as a consequence we change. So that's just something I'd like to say. Great. I think Christopher has to get going and we all do. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that, guys. I'm like, <laughs> no, that, that's, that's, I love this to get in there. So I'm trying no, to I on. actually feel like this particular program, we're only eight minutes after nine, but I feel like we've been talking for hours. I think it was intense and good. Yeah. No, it really was. We got a, we got a lot. Uh, we, we spoke about a lot. We got, you know, we yeah. covered a lot. So glad we were able to do that. Yeah, glad you're able to be with us. So I guess we'll just uh, use that as the occasion to sign off. Is there anything you'd like to say to us, Diane, before we jump off this? That everyone should tune in tomorrow at two o'clock at the LaRoucheOrganization.com for the meeting. Okay, so that's- See you next week. Good night.